Am I making any sense? All right, here we go with another episode of Am I Making Sense? Today I have a very special guest, a true renaissance man. You may have seen him in Interview Date, Killer Kate, and Comics Unleashed, to name a few. He performs stand-up comedy around the nation and has been on countless podcasts and radio shows. Most importantly, he has a new stand-up album coming out called Scheduled Fun Times. Thank you for joining me. It's the indomitable Grant Lyon. Hey, what's going on, Grant? I yeah, appreciate it. Thanks for happy to be here. Yeah, yeah. We're quarantined off. We're sheltered in place. We were supposed yeah. to do it uh, in person, but you know, these are the times we live in. Indeed, they are. Uh, I've had. I interestingly enough, none of my May shows have canceled officially yet. And yeah. I'm like, I'm like, what are you guys waiting for? We know that they're not going to happen. There's no way they're going to happen in May. Yeah, I don't. It doesn't look that way. Um, well, it's kind of tapering. The amount of people being diagnosed with it the last two days has tapered a little. But I think they're going to want to see it really totally. drop off. I, I just think probably live comedy shows are one of the last things that's going to come back, right? That is so true. And we're yeah. going to have to get in that because it's not just comedy. I mean, it's... It's everything. Who's going to want to go to a concert? Yeah. You know, no. a standing I mean. room only concert. Get out of here. Yeah. Anything like, yeah, we'll, we'll start opening restaurants yeah. at half capacity. Right. We'll start opening bars at one third capacity. Things like right. that. Those are all going to ramp up way before comedy clubs. And I think so. Concerts are back for sure. Yeah. Yeah, I got, I was supposed to, I was the last week of the, um, the Rooster Tees comedy competition and the, uh, they closed it that week and she sent, Heather sent another email saying to the people in it, I'm sure yourself, anyone who's booked there saying, okay, now we're going to go through May, but I'm kind of like, I don't know. I have the same line of thinking that you do that comedy clubs are probably, unfortunately, they're going to be the last thing probably. Yeah. I mean, I hope they come back obviously uh, yeah. rather than later, but I'm, I'm prepared for it to be like July or something like that before they really come back. I think so. That could yeah. be. So, um, so yeah. Hey Grant, usually I like to get into things about starting off with comedy, but I saw your bio. I saw yeah. you used to be a collegiate soccer player. That's true. Not too far from you at UC Santa Cruz. Nice. Nice. Yeah. So I got a two-part question for you. Okay. Um, one, do you still follow soccer? And then two is, do you have any opinions on the U.S. national team, men's national team, on whether or not they'll ever be able to find a rhythm, find success, or if United States is kind of doomed to be in uh, national soccer purgatory. Uh, I have very strong opinions about this and we could spend the entire podcast. Nice. About this. <laughs> Let's get into it. <laughs> because yes, there's I a do. Yes, I do still follow soccer. Uh, okay. I, uh, I probably follow, um, you know, international tournaments the most, the Euro world cup, things like that. And then I follow the EPL um pretty closely um okay i you know i check in on the mls i admit that i don't watch it maybe as much as i should you know yeah. well you but, like what you like yeah well and it's just you know when you when you watch the english premier league it's like the mls is certainly getting better it's yeah. just nowhere approaching the epl or international tournaments in terms of speed of play and quality and that sort of stuff yet and i okay. say this as someone who you know, probably 12 of my teammates in college played in the MLS. Oh, nice. Uh, stuff. So, you know, I used to follow it maybe more closely when I actually had friends on teams. Yeah. And now I'm at the age where pretty much everybody is retired or is out okay. of the league and stuff by now. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm in my mid thirties, you know? Yeah. I feel like a career, most careers don't really make it past early thirties in soccer. Um, yeah. But in terms of the men's national team, do I think we are going to compete on the world stage? Uh, no, um, yeah. or not for a long time. You yeah. know, fifty years from now, maybe. <laughs> yeah, maybe, yeah. You know, uh, and I and I think the reasons are uh, multiple. Multiple fold is one. It's just not part of soccer. It's not part of our culture. Yeah, like it is 
So I went down in 2006, I went down and played in Brazil for a couple of weeks. Okay. And um, just walking through these poor neighborhoods and stuff like that. And you're like, these kids are playing barefoot and they're bawling, right? Yeah. They are sick. And it's like, we just don't, we just don't do that. In America. Yeah. You know, it's not part of our, it's not a religion here. Like no. It is in some places in the world. No, you know? it's scheduled fun time for us. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But nice segue. <laughs> yeah. Nice segue. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, and, and I think, you know, also the other thing is right in, in some of the world, their best athletes are going gravitating towards soccer. Yeah. Our, our best athletes aren't usually, no. you know, if, if we had, if we said soccer, all the best athletes are going to play soccer and we're mm -hmm. not going to put them in basketball or football or tennis or all of these other things. Yeah. And yeah, I think we would compete on the yeah. world stage, but there's a reason, you know, we're sacrificing our dominance in soccer for our dominance in basketball and football right. and baseball and all of these other types of things. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, that's the sense. Uh, anyone, anytime I bring it up, I'm not a big, I don't follow soccer religiously. I have a daughter who plays and I kind right. of view it through that angle. Um, but I, certainly I've always supported national teams anytime in World Cup, both men and women. And um, kind of check into MLB every now and again. Um, or sorry, MLS, MLB. Yeah, See, yeah. I'm already, <laughs> so I'll check into it from time to time because here in San Jose, we have a pretty, we have a decent yeah. club with the um, Quakes. But the, the story I get over and over, you said the word religion. Yeah. And people say that like, no, you don't understand. It's not, not just that um, people in Brazil play to win. Yes, they play to win, but that's their style. And each person is developing almost their voice. Like in comedy, you talk about developing your voice or whatever. Well, every person in Brazil wants to develop their voice in soccer. And so yeah. style and just performance and the, the play of it, you know? Not yeah, just totally. the competitive aspect to it, but it's like I'm doing art right now, and this yeah, is my yeah, painting, yeah. and it it involves a soccer ball. And so the, I also, uh, when I was in earlier in college, I went and played in Costa Rica for a couple mm -hmm. of weeks, and one of the things that was so interesting to see is like you know we were going all over the country. It's not a huge country, so we're going we're playing games all over the country, and we're stopping and having practices in these small villages and stuff like that, which is a really cool experience. But you'd go to some of these small villages and without exaggeration, the nicest thing in the entire village would be their soccer pitch. Right. Right. Where it's like, there is not much money in this community. And yet that is nicer than most of the fields I play on in oh. uh, grown up playing in America. You know, yeah. it's like that's where they're putting their resources. Yep. You know? uh, yeah. I mean, one of the coolest experiences of my life was we got off, we were in, this is, I went with my college soccer team and we were, um, you know, on a tour bus sort of thing. And we stopped in this small village, couldn't have been, you know, more than a thousand people uh, living in this, in this town. Mm -hmm. And we stopped, uh, we stopped our tour bus and we had practice there okay. in their, in the, on their field in the middle of this town. And the entire town came out and watched it. Oh. People were like sitting on the roofs of buildings. People had climbed trees all around the field and everybody yeah. was just watching us practice. We weren't even like doing a scrimmage or anything. Yeah, like that. Yeah. We're just doing drills and everybody was watching us. Yeah. That's a different really mindset. Cool. Yeah, for sure. I, yeah, I think in America, it's it's like you said, there's so many distractions that we have. And yeah. the talent pool is really, if kids dream, they dream in NBA, they dream in um, MLB and NFL. Those are the way, that's kind of the, the zeitgeist yeah. of our sports dreams, the and way it goes. Think about it. I, I was reading this thing recently about the average professional sports contract in America. You know, you can make a lot of money if you're good enough to play professional in England or Spain or something like that. But yeah. in America, um, you know, I think they were saying the average NBA contract was eight million a year. The average NFL contract was like four million a year. Major yeah. League Baseball was close to four million a year, too. 
an MLS average contract was like 300,000. Yeah. Which, still a great living for That's most living. people, yeah. but when you're comparing that to guys making millions, you know, it's like if I'm a if I'm a kid and I'm like want to go down a path to make some money and get out of my situation or something like that, soccer's not the sport I'm going to pick. Yeah. You know. Yeah, and it, it is rough because that's another American. Oh, um, the camera's bouncing a little bit. Yeah, I, don't I just know if it's. I just moved my. Uh, you moved it. Okay. My my legs. That's another sad, I guess, symptom of being in America is we think about dollars. Yeah. When yeah. we think about what we love to do, like it would be a shame if there was a kid out there who really loved soccer and was a talented athlete, but then was getting advised, "Oh, but there's money down the road for baseball," and then he yeah, begrudgingly yeah. swings a bat and gives up on something he really loves. But I bet that happens here in the States anyway. Totally. Um, yeah. How old's your daughter? She's nine going on 10. So okay. it's, um, it's uh, about her, the time where it starts getting fairly competitive. Oh, I'm so impressed. So she switched over from rec league to one of these club type yeah. teams. That's I'm about so, I, I switched over to club as well. Okay. Was that in Santa Cruz here? Uh, no, in that was in Los Angeles. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. okay. Yeah, no, um, I'm so impressed with the level of coaching. Like, they're yep. legit. Totally. You know, the the rec league was just kind of, oh, go run around. There's some cones. Try and get the ball around. But these guys are running. Like, right now, she's doing Zoom meetings twice a week to get, you know, um, she has to do her footwork on the camera. Yeah, and yeah. And the coaches are quizzing them and making sure they're keeping in their journal. And it's all that's good great. stuff. And she loves it, um, fortunately. So. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. And you ask like how I feel about the American team. I do think, do I think we are going to challenge for world cup titles? Yeah. Um, in the next 40 years? No. Yeah. Do I think we can be a consistent quarter finalist, sometime semi-finalist? Yes. I think we could be there, which yeah. is, you know, not at all right now a successful World Cup to us is making it to the round of 16, right? right? We get yeah. out of our group. That is a successful World Cup to us. So now I think, you know, the next step is being a cons consistent quarter finalist. And I think we do have the resources and the talent to be there at some point. Mm -hmm. We just need the right development and player pool. Yeah. You know? So you don't think it's a coaching thing? Oh, I do Maybe think it is a coaching thing. Oh, it's a coaching thing. Okay. Um, but that's uh, the big thing is it's the it's a coaching thing young. It's not a coaching thing once you're 17 through 30. It's uh, a coaching thing when you're 8 yeah. and 9 and 10. Yeah. You know, when you show promise in places like Europe or South America, you go and live at a soccer right. complex at the age of 9 and you are right. training all the time. And you are living and breathing soccer. If you show promise, that's your path. We don't yeah. have anything like that for our youth development here. Yeah. That's where that's where we are lacking is our right. youth development. And we would probably have some kind of uh la labor law or some kind of ethical <laughs> qualms yeah. about <laughs> yeah. you know, doing that with children. So yeah, maybe. We need to send them off. <laughs> turn them into soccer warriors at a young age. Yeah. Cool, man. Yeah, no, I'm very curious about it. And I could probably go on and on about soccer also, even though, like <laughs> I said, it's not necessarily um, something I was raised with, but now I'm somewhat into it. And I'm always curious to hear people's opinions. Yeah. Um, but, but moving on to other things. So stand up, you have a special coming out. One thing I like to do is get a sense for when people join the podcast, when was the first time where you felt like you either had the bug to do stand up or how did it culminate? What was your first open mic that you went to? When did you know yeah. you wanted to get into stand up? Can you go a little bit into your origin stories? Totally. Um, well, as we already talked, it's an easy transition right here because I was a college soccer player. Yeah. And soccer was my whole life uh, before I found comedy. And I was a kid, you know, I, I did the musicals at school and I, okay. you know, I watched The Simpsons and I quoted The Simpsons all the time in yeah, high yeah. school for jokes, but I never knew that stand-up existed. It wasn't okay. in my purview at all. Yeah. And I, when I got to college, my roommate 
played Mitch Hedberg's uh, first album, Strategic Grill Locations. Okay. Uh, and it blew my mind, and I loved yeah. it so much. I loved it so much that I like listened to it over and over. And it's music. Memorized. Yeah. yeah. I it's mean, music. I legitimately memorized almost all of that album, yeah. and I uh, I uh, started doing it for my like soccer teammates. You know, okay. just like at practice and stuff yeah. like that. I just like, you know, in between drills, I would just yeah. tell some Mitch Hedberg jokes. And when we were in Costa Rica on that trip I mentioned earlier, uh, mm -hmm. we were on the tour bus after our last game. And it was probably the best game we'd played. We beat yeah. this team that w nobody expected us to beat. Uh, everybody was feeling really good. And on the like two hour bus ride back, people got up on the microphone at the front of the bus and just started, started telling knock, knock jokes and street nice. jokes and that sort of stuff. It was and getting all, punchy. Yeah. Yeah. And all my friends were like, Grant, go do some Mitch Hedberg. Like, you know, yeah, Mitch yeah. Hedberg stuff. So I went up at the front of the bus and probably did 25 minutes off of that album. I stood up wow. there for 25 minutes just doing Hedberg jokes. Uh, and that was the first time I was like, wow, that was fun. Like I'd never stood up then and obviously none of it was my material or anything like yeah. that. And it was all for people I knew intimately, right? All yeah. my teammates and my coaching staff and things like that. And, uh, you know, I was like, man, that was really fun. But I still didn't think, oh, I can be a comedian, right? I was like, no, yeah. I'm, I was funny because I was doing his stuff. I'm, yeah. I'm not, I'm not funny. I'm funny because I... I'm quick with a Monty Python quote or a Simpsons quote, or I can do, I can plug those into the right situations, but I'm not yeah. making it up myself. And, uh, and it was actually my college soccer coach every single day at practice was like, I want to hear some Grand Latin originals. That was great. Uh, man. You gotta write something. And I probably poo pooed that for a month, but he said it so much that finally there would be just a thing that would happen in my life. And I'd be like, Oh, that could make a funny joke or something like that. And I started yeah. writing things down. Okay. Uh, and so the first set I ever did was later that season on another tour bus. And I got up and I probably did 10 minutes of my own jokes in front of my yeah. soccer teammates. You nice. Know? And, uh, and then from there I was doing like house parties on campus where uh, a bunch of my friends would be there and they would turn off the music for 10 minutes and be like, everybody shut up. Grant's going to tell jokes for 10 minutes. Wow. And I would like stand up on a couch. And I did that for five months before okay. I ever worked up the courage to like actually go to an open mic that wasn't a bunch of my friends you know, yeah. and wasn't people that I knew. And okay. so I went and signed up for an open mic on campus and that was when I felt like, oh, this could be a real thing, right? Because I signed up, I did five minutes, and I crushed at this open mic. And nice. I like, I literally like ran the whole way back to my apartment and wow. like, was just so excited. And yet still, even after that, I didn't perform off of campus for another five months. Okay. This was probably... That first open mic I did was probably February, and I didn't do a set off of campus until June or July. You okay. Know? Yeah. So yeah. it was still a very slow sort of process. And when someone asks me, so that was my sophomore year of college, where I was kind of like, you know, the the tour bus was in August of uh, my sophomore year before yeah. the school year started, and then you know it was October when I did the. But you probably weren't even 21 yet, so you couldn't go to bars I was, necessarily. I was, I was not 21 yet. Yeah. And so that whole, so then then I went um, back to, I, my mom was living in Sacramento, and I had a summer job in Sacramento, so I went to Sacramento that summer after my sophomore year of uh, college, and that was when I first started doing, like, going to a bar. They have an open mic, and I wasn't 21, okay. so I would have to stand outside oh. of the bar, yeah. wait until my set, someone would escort me into on stage. I'd do oh. five minutes and then they would have to escort me off. Wow. Yeah. I remember one time I was in this competition that summer uh -huh. and I couldn't even be inside when they were like announcing the winners. I mean, it was like a dumb bar show competition. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It wasn't that big a deal, but I yeah. couldn't even be inside when they were like announcing the winners. And yeah. Stuff. 
And then, so uh, then that, that fall of my junior year of college, uh, we had a really successful season. My team made the national championship. Nice. I didn't do stand up once from August through December because okay. I was just so focused on, yeah. uh, on the train. Yeah. And then it was January of my junior year. When someone asked me, when did I start comedy? That's when I feel like I started comedy. Makes sense. January of my yeah. junior year was when I was like, you know what? I legit want to do this. And yeah. I want to do this more and take this more seriously. And that's the first time that I started like driving around the Bay Area and yeah. doing uh, at least like a couple open mics a week. And yeah. stuff. Like that. I was on stage at least two times a week starting like January, 2005. Got know? it. Yeah. yeah. So that's nice that's to me where I'm like this, the, the year and a half before that was all just sort of like dabbling. Am I going to do this? Is this, this a dumb college thing that I want to do? Yeah. And that January of 2005, my junior year was when I was like, no, this is what I want to do. Yeah. The commitment piece of it kicked in. Yeah, for sure. Uh I, I, yeah, I wonder, it's, it's tough because I know here in the South Bay, there's one or two mics where young people can, um, you know, get up and, and do stand up. But I think the way the liquor laws are just structured, it's very difficult for the under 21 performers to get stage time because you describe people actually escorting you. I think the places, a number of the places where I go to, they won't even, I, I that's not even an option for people under 21. Oh, because really? Yeah, they're just they it's like no, you have to be 21 to be in here. And they might just do it to simplify things cuz they don't want to get Yeah. You know. We had a couple of I I have a show, a monthly show in a, in LA mm -hmm. in a bar and we have had some under 21 performers, but the it's a secret bar hidden behind a barber shop. Yeah. And so the whole idea is you have to hang out in the barber shop. You cannot come back here until it is your time to perform. Ah. And, and uh, yeah. So that's a cool angle. That. Yeah. Uh, I like that. What's the name of that show? The blind barber. We call the blind it the blind barber. barber secret show. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. That's yeah. Fun. I like the sound of that. So I saw when you, um, when we first start off, you're working on a script. So I wanted to get your take on you yeah, write for your stand-up act. There, there you we go. go. People. <laughs> that's really cool. Yeah. So you write for your standup, uh, you, you've written, uh, are you writing a script? Um, what, what are the different challenges that you face between writing standup comedy versus writing scripts or even writing for other comedy for other people or just uh, funny television type dialogue? Yeah, they, they are all very different for sure. Um, you know, I, I, the way I've always felt is that every idea has its right medium. And so sometimes I'm like, well, I really like this idea. This is not something I can do in stand up or in sketch or something like that. So what's the right medium for that? Uh, and so I never like set out to be, you know, I'm going to be a scriptwriter or whatever. I've just yeah. sort of followed ideas where they've taken me, I suppose. Yeah. Uh, I think the hardest part, uh, about switching between stand-up and screenwriting is the the level of depth you have to go right yeah. if i'm working on a bit i'm going to give it a couple of hours and i'm going to work yeah. on it and then i'm going to try it on stage and then i'll pay attention to how it does and yeah. rewrite it beyond that but it's it's not a thing that's actively like consuming me all the time right yeah. it's like you perform it you think about it for a while after the show what's a way i could do differently then you let it rest until the next time you perform then you try it a little bit differently whereas like the script is like i need to carve out a week to not be thinking about anything else Ooh, that's tough right where i'm yeah. like i otherwise i just can't wrap my brain around it enough Luckily, my family has a um, cabin in the in the woods, uh, a couple oh. hours outside of Los Angeles. So I go there and I just yeah. write there a bunch. Okay. Where I'm like, I'm going up there. I'm not. I'm like putting my phone on airplane mode, and I'm just like putting these post-it notes up on the walls, and I'm just 
thinking. And anytime I hit a snag, I just go for a walk. And I think for like an hour about Mm -hmm. that, about that scene, about that character, about that motivation, whatever it is that I want to do. And so that's one of the things where it's like, it's hard to deep dive sometimes, right? And and sometimes I think we all um, do a thing where we go, oh, I'll just work on this social media post because that's easier than working on this like yeah, really so hard tangent. thing yeah. that I can't wrap my head around, but I know that there's something I need to do here. Yeah. Know? So It's almost so big you don't know where to start in a script scenario. Yeah. You know, I think the best script I've written, my best feature film came because I was so devastated that I had nowhere else to go. Uh. And so it was through, I went through this like horrible breakup like three and a half years ago. And, um, you know, I didn't want, we were living together. We were talking about getting married and, uh, and she broke up with me and then started dating another dude before I had moved out. And so I was just like, I was just really devastated. And, uh, and so I had this idea for a script and I'm like, and I was like, I just need to like get out of here. Yeah. And so I went to the cabin and I wrote a first draft of that script in three days, like through tears, just like, yeah. Uh, and then I've rewritten it a bunch. And, you know, there were definitely yeah. things then that I was like, boy, this was just a lot of emotion. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it was like very helpful to just like have this impetus to just create. Right. I don't want to think about, I can't think about anything else right now. And it was an idea for a script about a breakup. So I could pour a bunch of like emotions into it and stuff. Yeah. At no other point in your life would you have that same rawness to be able to approach a script. Yeah, for sure. And I think it's the best script I've written. Nice. Yeah. So, so when you get a script like that, what, what's the next step? How do you, um, I, I mean, I'm from obviously the open mic scene, but I don't even know, you know, even if I had a script, I wouldn't know what to do with it at that point. Yeah. I mean, it's like getting it to people, your industry contacts, right? I know a decent amount of people at production companies uh, or okay. agents, that sort of stuff. And you're getting the script to them to see whether they respond to it and want it. Cause me taking it out doesn't do that much, but I get a production company on board. That's like, man, we love this. Uh, now people are going to now, you know, network studios, all that sort of stuff are going to pay attention a lot more. Got it. So, you know, and I have a manager that helps get it out to folks and that sort of stuff too. You know, uh, one of the best things to do if you mm-hmm. are a writer that doesn't have like the connections like that yeah. is enter screenplay competitions. There uh, are well-respected screenplay competitions. If you can be a finalist in one of these, now people will take notice, right? You will get meetings with agents and managers and production companies because of the notoriety that being a finalist in the screenplay competition has brought you. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I think right now I'm just 100% focused on writing jokes and telling jokes. And I think you touched on something that I think is really true. Like the deep focus it takes to write either a story, novel, even short story or script versus yeah. writing a joke or a bit. It's yeah. like, I think stand-up comedy is perfect for those of us with short attention spans yes, and who are willing to walk away from something, you know, like like you talked about trying to bit out a couple times, to- two or three times or whatever, and then going, ah, maybe I'm not that married to it. Like yeah. that happens to us all the time in stand-up comedy, right? Sure. I mean, I've been doing it for 15 years and still half of the stuff that I say on stage won't ever yeah. make it into my act. You right. Know? It's just it the hit ratio is so low, I feel like. And, and that's what I mean. It's like you know, the hit ratio used to be even lower for me. And through 15 years of experience, I've gotten it up to maybe 50 50, but that's still like a lot of misses, you know? Yeah. That's still no, a lot of misses. I, you know, I haven't been in the game long enough to know, but I, I'm thinking this might be comparable like batting averages. Where yeah. if 30% of the jokes you write are good, then you're doing really well for yourself. Yeah, totally. I agree with that. And I think, you know, I do think there is some sense to like, you know, once you've figured out your voice, you're going to write mm. for yourself more yeah. effectively, right? I mean, my first, 
I can look back and and really th- say, I didn't write anything that I st- like me now. When was the first time I wrote a joke that I think looking back on, I'm like, that was a good joke. And it was probably like three years in. I don't wow. think anything I wrote before three years in would I feel comfortable saying now. And then, you know, between that like three and five year period, I'm like, there's a few, right? Yeah. There's not a ton. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Like a few. Yeah. Uh, that I had, you know, I look back on, 10 minutes that I wrote between three and five years pretty fondly. And yeah. then after like the five years now, I'm like, okay, now I've started to figure out what my voice is, what I want to do on stage, who I want to be. Yeah. And that's like, uh, now that has, now I'm like, okay, I, I've written a bunch of stuff that I feel good about, you know, that. Yeah. Is there anything that you thought you wanted to give up on and then came back to and found a way to make it work? Oh, for sure. And I think actually one of my biggest shortcomings as a comedian is that I will try something for too long. Mm. Like I will keep coming back to something year after year to see if I have a different angle on it and different work. And sometimes I'm like, just fucking, and it does work out sometimes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But for every, two that work out there's another like six or seven that i'm like why am i trying to make this work again yeah yeah yeah. never worked let it move on yeah you know so but yeah i mean there's been things that i'm like i you know i think some of it is is what's your way in to the Mm. joke and finding a different way in could make all of the difference okay i i had i had this whole Thing I was trying to do about insurance companies call things acts of God. And, and I had this whole sort of intellectual bit about it that I tried and I could never, like, it was like, it would do okay, but it was never good enough to justify hmm. like being in my full set or whatever. Yeah. And, uh, and I set it aside for years, didn't come back to it. And then I had an actual experience with a drunk driver and an insurance company. Okay. And it gave me this like story and personal connection into like, I, this is why I'm frustrated with insurance companies. And also here's another thing about insurance companies that is bullshit. They will still call things acts of God. And now that acts of God stuff does way better than it ever did before because I have this whole drunk driver insurance company story that leads me into it. Right. Got it. Yeah. Yeah. And so I have more of like a, I've built a personal connection with the material and the audience and now that stuff works way better. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Do you find, um, I know you have improv in your, in your background too. Do you find improv helps you out with the standup? Oh, I think they all are, um, you know, different notches you can put in your tool belt, you know, different. Yeah. Di- I, I think all of it informs um, the other. Yeah. Uh, I, I definitely think that improv and stand up require so much of your energy that you kind of eventually have to pick a lane. It, it's yes. fair for some people, for people yeah. to just do it all. Yeah. Uh, and. But I think early on it is worth doing training and all of that stuff because I think improv helps you uh, think on your feet a lot more so that when you're doing stand-up and you don't have to be married to your material all the time, right? Like nobody wants to see a joke robot on stage. They want to see you being in the moment with them. And, uh, you know, that's what makes any live performance great is that it's a show that will never happen again, right? Yeah. I'm not a guy that will seek out crowd work all the time, but I also don't shy away from it if it presents itself. And I imagine that's probably somewhat because of my improv. Yeah. You know? Uh, And I think, you know, all of that stuff helps with confidence too. Just being like, okay, I can do this thing. I can do this thing. I can do this thing right now. Now I'm not worried about different scenarios and situations that might come up because I feel like I have, the experience to deal with anything at this point. Yeah. Plus the way I, the way I experience as a fan of stand-up comedy, 
I always um, enjoy when a really good act out happens in yeah. a person's, per, person's stand up. And I think, you know, some of the act outs are, you could almost credit to like, this is, I'm watching an improv, a one man improv skit yeah, at this yeah. point, even though they know where they're going and it's not as interactive, but nevertheless, I would imagine that the improv training builds that muscle that if you need an act out in your performance, totally. then it'll be that much more stronger. And I think with sketch and improv, they, they teach you commitment, mm. right? Stand-ups don't always have that much commitment, right? We bail on jokes and we yeah. bail on stuff and we have save lines yep. that, you know, oh boy, I'm not going to do that one again, you know, yeah. that sort of stuff. We have all those like little tricks, but I think improv, you know, it's like if you go up there and a scene has been set, you better fucking commit to it because you can't. You can't get out of this right now. Yeah. And so I think that helps with stand up too is like commit to shit. If you're going to do an act out, commit to it. Yeah. Right? Yeah, um, I do that. I've done that on multiple times where it's almost like you're making apologies for your bombed joke. Yeah. And then you get off stage and go, I feel so icky after. I should have just either rolled on, I should have rolled through it and I go, I have more material. Let me roll into something else. Or I should have done something along the lines of, uh, you know, just, just own it, but don't make excuses for the bomb. Oh, and well, yeah, with improv, I would imagine I haven't done it yet. It looks like a blast. If, if I have more time down the road, I definitely want to try it. But, um, I, I think, yeah, to your point, it's a really good muscle to just say, this is where I'm at. And I'm going to plow through this and I'm going to make, I'm going to try and make as much fun out of whatever's happening right now. Yeah. Yeah. And stand up sometimes even stand up. I don't know. I, I get the sense from time to time that we can take ourselves seriously, like too serious. Like we're supposed to be jokers up there. Like it's okay. Yeah, totally. If things aren't going your way, you don't have to take it so serious and feel crushed. Oh, I, think, and, I think we are. We do take it very seriously. Yeah. We also take it very personally. I think yeah. that's one of the the hardest things. I mean, I did it too. I mean, I can't believe that I, you know, now when I look back on my early days of stand up, I'm like, man, I must have like. I, I cannot believe that I stuck with it, right? Because yeah. I was somebody that was fairly good, um, yeah. you know, for a person that was just starting, but yeah. I still bombed, you know, at least every other week. Yeah. And I, it hurt so much. I would like cry in my car all the yeah. time. I cried in my car so much after yeah, yeah. the first year of stand up. I mean, I, I remember thinking that I was ready to like host a week at the improv in San Jose yeah. and doing very well on a set there and then approaching the manager and asking him for a week and him telling me why I wasn't funny and why I would never amount to it. Like, yeah. I, mean, that, I mean, I was depressed for days, you know? Yeah. Uh, nowadays, like one of the nice things of with experience and, and, you know, credits or things like that is that I've done so many thousands of shows now over mm -hmm. the years that if something doesn't go well, I no longer take it personally, right? Either it's like, either I'll think about, okay, what did I do wrong? Did I alienate the crowd in some way? Like, or I'm like, these people just aren't my people. Like, I'm yeah. sorry. I, I, I almost feel sorry for the crowd rather than I feel hurt or upset. I'm like, this is what I do. And I know that this is good because thousands of people all over have responded to this. Yeah. So if you're not, it's kind of on you. And I feel bad for you that you made the wrong choice this evening. Yeah. 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 You know, it's like almost that idea where I'm like, I don't, I'm sorry, this is not for you, but this is what I do. And so you're welcome to leave, but this is what I do. You know? <laughs> this, yeah, yeah, this is my story. I, yeah. was trying, I was trying to think of an analogy the other day. I was uh, podcasting. I don't know if you ever met Jeff, Jeff Applebaum. He's a, oh, yeah, Jeff and uh, I started out right around the same time together. Okay, great. He was the yeah. last guest on, on the podcast. So we were talking about, and I was trying to think of the metaphor of like a lens, right? So you can't, um, it's very easy to fall into the trap of saying people don't like me and what I'm, what I'm interpreting and putting out there is not worthy, but no, no, no. 
Those are people who don't really care about what the lens you're seeing things through. Yeah, totally. And also early on, your lens is blurry. You don't know how to focus yeah, the yeah. lens. You know, but let's say you have your voice and you're at a place where you are and no, I've focused my lens and this is what I'm doing. This is what I'm saying on stage. There are people who want to see that view, but they aren't always yeah. in the room. <laughs> so, yeah, totally. So you just got to get, you know, keep going at it until people know how to find you. And then eventually the audience will connect with the picture or the voice or the whatever you want to call it. And yeah. then hopefully everything comes together. Dude, I mean, look at talking about, we talked about Hedberg earlier. Yeah. If you want to see the perfect example of this, uh, watch Hedberg's unedited half hour comedy central special. Okay. Those, those half hour comedy central specials end up being like 22 or 23 minutes. Right. Hedberg bombs so much in it that yeah. he ends up doing like 45 minutes to try to give them something to edit together into like 22 minutes. Because this was, I mean, this is a guy that was on the verge of being famous yeah. when he died, cult following, everybody, so many people love him, making yeah. a ton of money, and yet he still would absolutely bomb in front of a crowd that didn't know who he was, that didn't know what he was going to do and what he was about, right? Yeah. But, you know, I've heard this said before where it's like, if a hundred people walk out of the room and go, yeah, that guy was funny, he was all right. Yeah. And then never think about you again. That does less for your career than 99 people hating you and one person walking out and going, that's the funniest person I've ever seen. I want to know everything that they're doing. Interesting. You know? Yeah. It's not about necessarily the people who hate you or the people who are like, eh, it's about that w one or those fans yeah. that really just connect. Well, I'm sure you've heard this theory of like a thousand true fans, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. I've heard yeah. of that. Well, it's, I mean, that's really what the age we're living in. It's like you, if you can build a thousand true fans and, you know, the, the theory is like, right, if you have a thousand people that are willing to spend a hundred dollars on you a year, you're making a hundred thousand dollars. Right. And right. that's a living as an artist. Yeah. You know, it's like, all right, well, maybe I'm not generating, you know, a hundred dollars worth of stuff every year. Right. You know, yeah. I'm not, I'm not doing that, but, but I'm generating you know, 25 to $50 worth of stuff yeah. a year. And is our, our, is uh 5,000 true fans? Is that like an achievable goal? Well, that feels pretty achievable to yes. me, right? In the internet age, that's very achievable. But I mean, you find, yeah. you build 5,000 true fans and you're making a living as an artist. Yeah. You know? Yeah, I think another thing has happened where the notion of, uh, comic mega stardom. I think the sun has set on that. Yeah, it's good and bad. I think it's good because obviously, you know, society is get, getting more and more. I don't want to use the word divided, but it seems like the most correct word. More and more divided, but our tastes are very much more particular now. Yeah, and so niches make riches. What's that? You ever heard of it? niches make riches? Niches oh, I haven't heard got, that. Yeah, you gotta find. You have to find a niche right now. There you go. Yeah. And so it's, um, it, and our audiences are much more accessible mm -hmm. because of the internet and because of the medium is just, and now, I mean, we haven't even got to talking about the state of affairs we're in right now where, um, you know, probably internet performing is going to have to be a thing for at least a few more months. Yeah. Um, but I think that we'll never have maybe the priors, and the Hedbergs and, um, you know, the, the really big acts. Yeah. Uh, even there, they are out there, right? Chappelle's out there. He's a huge act. Um, Joe yeah. Coy is doing arenas. So there are these big acts, yeah. but that's, but you don't need to strive for that anymore. No, totally. Yeah. I mean, and there's like a ton of people now that aren't even going to comedy clubs, yeah. right? It's like, I've built a following, not me, but I'm saying, because yeah. I haven't done this yet, but I have, I'm friends with plenty of people that are like, I've built a following through my podcast and through my album and this and that. Mm -hmm. I don't want to go to a comedy club anymore. I am going to do a, a tour where I go to a town and I do a show in an indie rock club and mm -hmm. I take the door 
And I've built up enough of these niche followings in these different yeah. places that I can go from city to city and sell out these places. One of my old roommates is Shane Moss. And uh, oh, yeah. he, uh, man, he, Shane's done such a great job of like building these sort of niche shows, right? He did like a psychedelic comedy show. Yep. Now he's doing this uh, science comedy show. Uh, and he can go to these places and promote science comedy and people even if they're not like oh i don't know who shane moss is but they're like well, i like science and this sounds yeah. funny and interesting so i'll go to that show yeah. or hey man i've always liked doing mushrooms i'll check this out and yeah, yeah he has really built a following and shane barely does comedy clubs anymore mm, you know? interesting yeah i liked his documentary totally and shane's and shane i mean Shane has a Netflix special. He's got a Comedy Central half hour. Yeah. He could do any comedy club in the country that he wants to do, and he would yeah. do very well, and people would like him. But he is more thinking about, like, well, how do I, instead of going to a comedy club where there's just going to be a bunch of people who don't know who I am, how can I do a show for the people that want to see me and yeah. are interested in the stuff that I want to talk about? You know? Yeah. And I think there's a lot of power to that. It's yeah, I think so. It, bringing it directly to your people. And it feels less exploitive, yeah. right? Because he's probably t talking direct to the venues and there's not as many hands sure. in the, 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 I don't know, I'm just speculating, but. Yeah, no, I think um, in the end, if you can actually, if you do have a following, you make more money that way too. Yeah, you know, definitely. So on to the, this pandemic that we're in that we touched on a little yeah. bit at the top of the hour, how do you see entertainment recovering from this what do you think are the steps as performers that each of us have to be thinking about yeah. um to get to get i guess out of this mess and also everyone i'm imagining everyone's going to be very anxious and afraid to be going out and i also think unfortunately there are going to be a lot of venues that will be casualties of this i agree um what do you, are you thinking about game plan to make it to get <laughs> I guess get, I think, to reboot the whole scene, if you will. Yeah, yeah. I think the hardest part of it right now, thinking about anything, is that we just don't know how long this is going to last for. I was yeah. talking to my buddy Brendan Lynch, who, who was a Bay Area comic. I don't know if you know him. The name uh, sounds very familiar. Yeah. yeah, he is a great dude. Very funny. Um, but we were talking on the phone yesterday, and and we were just talking about like, you know, what do you think happens at the end of this? you know, with comedy and how does comedy change? And and the hard thing is like, well, if it doesn't last that long, I don't think the landscape changes that much. It's yeah. just sort of like we've hit pause mm. and then and unpaused. Yeah. You know, if if everything is back to normal performing wise by June, I don't think there's any real sort of yeah. lasting changes. Yes, there might be a couple of comedy clubs that don't reopen because they didn't have enough of a of a, a safety net, you know, yeah. things like that. But I really don't think the landscape changes that much. It's just like, hey, that was like a crazy three month pause, yeah. and now we're back into it. If this lasts for a year, I think the landscape is drastically different at yeah. the end of it. You know, I've been doing a lot of these Zoom shows yeah. uh, right now, and you know. It's like, well, are these things going to exist beyond this? And it's like, I, I don't know that they will because yeah. while they are really great at meeting a need right now yeah. and I am enjoying doing them, yeah. they are still clearly a poor substitute for a yeah. live experience, right? Yeah. And we are making the best of yes. a, an awful situation right now. Yeah. But like are Zoom shows going to still exist once life is back to normal? Uh, I don't think so very much. Um, yeah, I hope not. You know? Yeah. Uh, and so, I mean, I definitely think right now is a time to be like reflecting on your path. And I think every performer should be doing that is like doing a bit of soul searching right now of like, well, what really does excite me what do i want to talk about how do i want to move forward you know what are realistic goals you know that sort of stuff so i think people should be evaluating that sort of stuff yeah. a lot right now 
Um, but it's, I mean, it's just so hard to say because we don't know, there is no end in sight. I mean, I, yeah. I could see a world where we are back to normal in June and I could see a world where we're not back to live shows until 2021, you know? Yeah. So I don't know. What do you think? Um, I'm, yeah, I'm optimistically, I'm hoping for that June scenario. <laughs> well, this yeah. is what I can say. I, I think me just kind of, I, even th- before the or- original shelter in place here in the Bay area went into place, I was very cavalier about the whole thing. Yeah. And I was one of these guys who was like, well, yeah, but doesn't the flu kill a lot of people? <laughs> and my yeah. wife kept saying, no, 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 you don't understand. Cause she has more friends who work in um, healthcare. And she goes, no, no, you don't understand it. The flu doesn't inundate healthcare facilities with people who need beds. And the big problem, I mean, obviously the problem is people dying. That's, that's the big problem, but she's, it's like, no, the, the hospitals are getting to hit capacity, which means every other person who needs help now takes second, second priority. So you, you have this catastrophic snowball effect. So I was very cavalier up and until the point Obviously, Italy and the numbers in Spain started me, making me nervous. And then here in the Bay Area, we did a, um, we got this shelter in place mandate, I think a week before California. Yeah. And that's when New York started really popping up. And then I go, oh man. And I started thinking, yeah. like I said, Grant, at the to- top of the pie, I started thinking about, wait a minute. I like, I like concerts. I like comedy clubs. I like dive bars. Yeah. I'll do open mic just because I like being in a dive bar with people. Yeah, yeah. And, and I'm thinking, how how much transmission is going on in places like this? And I never, I was always arrogant, like, well, I don't get sick that much. You know, I, I jog a couple times a week, so I'm not, I don't fit the criteria, but now after this whole thing, it's been kind of like, well, even if they say May 1st, everyone can go out. I don't know that I'll be in dive bars May 2nd. You know what I mean? I'll probably be, it'll be June. So, yeah. so what that means is I'm in an N plus one mentality. So if they say May, I'll probably be June. If they say June, it'll probably be July. Um, totally. And if I'm in that mentality and I was kind of arrogant yeah. and confident before this, that means probably the most of America is in somewhat of a similar mindset where they're going to dip their toe. Um, so yeah, I think, um, with respect to comedy, of course, the, the stage I'm at with open mics, it's going to really come down to the hardcore producers who are willing to get back out there and start their open mics up again. Yeah. And I'm certainly willing to throw my hat into that and find a venue that would be willing to host open mics. And then, of course, we have the big do-it-yourself scene here in the South Bay. So people who just produce shows in um, breweries and um, yeah. wherever else, they'll probably have to get it back online. I'm hoping... The, the club level scene, I'm hoping all the clubs had enough runtime and so that you touring yeah. comics will be out on the road again, you know, like that. Um, but I don't know. I think it's precarious. And, and more so than comedy, for, I'm thinking more like concerts and NBA games and things like, yeah. like stadiums. That's where, like, I know I've been sneezed and coughed on so many times at concerts that I don't know if I want to see a band that bad anymore. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Well, and, you know, one of the things that I've been thinking about that this brings into even more focus is as an artist, we need to create sources of passive income. Um, And this makes me think even more seriously about how to do that sort of stuff, right? It's like that I need albums, I need books, I need all of these sort of things. Get yourself a Patreon account. You know, it, it is. I mean, that's how you... Because boy, if if your entire income is based just on touring dates, it's too precarious. Yeah. Right. It's it's just this this is proof of that. Right. Yeah. Uh. So yeah, I was already thinking about that sort of stuff before this, but now it makes me double down on it even more. Yeah. Yeah. I know it's going to be interesting. I think everything will be fine. I think everyone will be fine, but I think everyone's going to be a little rattled for a bit oh, for here. Sure. Um, and so we will just have to, as usual, we'll have to get creative about, um, how to get things rebooted. Um, so speaking of that, that's a perfect, that's another perfect segue. (laughs) So talk to me about your album. How can people get your, uh, scheduled fun times? 
Yes. How can they get access to it? And then obviously we don't know when, but at some point you're going to be going on tour again. Is that to um, support the album or are you going to be trying out new stuff? What's that going to look like? Well, I, I'm, I'm not doing anything from the album at all. And I wasn't yeah. even this fall and, and winter. So okay. I like to, once I put it on an album, it's retired. And when yeah. you come see me live, you're seeing something totally different. So okay. I think that's a better way to make fans, right? Is I yes. want you to be seeing new stuff for me. I want you to be having new things to look forward to. Um, you know, if someone ever reaches out to me on social media and says, hey, I'm coming to see you. I'd love for you to do that joke. I'm always happy to do that sort of yeah. stuff. Uh, I'm not trying to be a snob about it. But right. you know, jokes aren't um, aren't like songs, right? It's like if you've heard them three or four times, you're pretty good. At, like, I don't know that I need to hear it 30 times. You know? I think I, I agree with that to some extent. But then, you know, in these times where sometimes you want a quick laugh, I, I still do my YouTube searches for guys like Hedberg, for guys yeah. like Rodney Dangerfield. He's another comfort food of mine. Like, totally. I know all his jokes. I know yeah. his timing. But for some reason, it's like, I, I want to hear that. I want to hear th those particular and, jokes from him again. Yeah, I like that, too, with the people I love. But if I went and saw them live, I would be hoping to see something different. Good point. Actually, yeah. that's happened to me on multiple occasions. Yeah. Where I'll go see a comic and I, it'll have been three years since I seen yeah. him. And then I'll go. Hey, and you're like, oh, but I could what? go listen to that stuff anytime I yeah, want. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I want to see something new from you. Right, um, right. So the album is, uh, I mean, literally available everywhere. It's on iTunes. Okay. It's on uh, Spotify. It's on Pandora. It's on uh, Google Play. It's on Amazon. I mean, people nice. can get it however they want to get it, you know? Okay. So, yeah, it came Fantastic. out March 24th. So it has just been out for, it's still brand new out there. Nice. Go yeah. check it out, people. Thank you. Cool, Grant. Well, is there anything else you want to um, cover right now? Any other stuff you're promoting? Uh, no, I mean, I uh, if, if people want to follow me, I do have other things coming out soon. So if people want to follow me on like social media, they'll see. I sold a board game that will be coming out this summer. Uh, I'm, Dude, uh, yeah. Oh, I, I wish I would have known you're into board games. I could yeah. talk board games. I could do a podcast on board games too. What's yeah. your talk to me about your board game? What's it like? Uh, it's called Curmudgeon. It's a party oh. game, best played with Perfect. friends. Okay. Uh, uh, the tagline is a game of silly insults, dummy. <laughs> uh, and <laughs> essentially, like uh, it's essentially like Mad Lib roasting. You know, that's Everybody, genius. Everybody has life cards in front of them. Your life cards might say like house, dog, hamster, fiance, any of that okay. sort of stuff. And then you've got um, like word cards in your hand and it's up to you to like make up an insult using these word cards and throw it down on an aspect of somebody's life. So like, well, here's an example. Like if you had the card hamster, okay. in front of you, I'm a, and I have the words uh, uh, obese, and uh uh night you know okay. i might say like your hamster is so obese it has to use a cpap machine at night <laughs> <laughs> and throw that down oh that's a great game for comedians yeah it's a super it forces it, you to think but it gives you some framework to work in but it allows you to be creative i don't know if like for me, as a comedian, I am not that interested in games like Cards Against Humanity. No, or like that where it, they're they're actually fairly boring to me. It's boring. Right? It's, it's there's no you you have no agency in the game at all. No. This is a game that allows you to be creative. Yes, you know, uh, which is why I think anybody that uh, and and I I've actually played it with a lot of people that don't consider themselves funny and have gotten big laughs in the yeah. game. Because they go, oh man, it's like you just throw a bunch of silly stuff together and it's funny. Yeah. Uh, and it doesn't require that much from you. Curmudgeon. Uh, curmudgeon. Okay. Coming out this summer. I can't wait for that. That's right Thank up my you. alley. Uh, How long did it take you to design that? Oh, about three years. Okay. Yeah, of play testing. And, you know, it took like a year of, essentially, it was like a year of development a year of play testing and redoing and then a year of like pitching to companies. Okay. Yeah. So someone else is uh, distributing it for you then. Yeah. Company. 25th century games. Um, okay. 
They're a company. Their biggest game is a game called Space Explorers, okay. um, which is like on the shelves of Barnes and Noble and Target and that sort of stuff. Nice. So, well, yeah. I'm definitely going to be getting that. Thank you. Um, what? How about you? Are you going to get a Patreon page up? I don't know. I have never. I have not done that before. Uh, to me, I'm like, if I have a podcast at some point, I will probably do a yeah. Patreon. But just to have a Patreon, I'm not sure I'm there yet. Well, is game is like playing board games something that you're into, or was it? Oh, this big was just time! Like, yeah, we play a shit ton in my house. Yeah, that's we own, we own like seventy five board games here and stuff. Wow. And we went, yeah, I mean, it's been really uh, boy. Am I glad to have all those during the shelter? Yeah. And like, you know, we've been playing a we've been playing a board game a day at least here. I live with three other comedians, so the four of us. There's so many good games you can play with four people. So. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, that's what we're, I, but you know, I have, my kids are younger, seven and nine. So their yeah. sophistication, it's not, we, we have some good games, but, totally. um, you know, they're kind of like, uh, exploding kittens and yeah. there's another game well, that, um, we, they got into, which I really enjoy called, um, mega city. Okay. Mega town. Anyway, it's one of these resource games like, um, seven wonders. Yeah. We love seven wonders. wonders here. Oh, that's a great game. Uh-huh. Seven no, Wonders no. Duel is, I think, the best two-player game there is out there. Oh, I haven't been exposed to that. That's it's Seven Wonders, but it's a two-player format of it. Okay, and it's great. It's great. I love it. I've tried writing jokes about board games. I've even tried writing jokes about Dungeons and Dragons on stage, yeah, but it yeah. feels really unrelatable. Okay. Um, sometimes they work, but a, a lot of times they don't. Um, but again, I think that's like the phase I'm in in standup, like you said, <laughs> a lot of my jokes aren't going to, aren't going to land. Yeah, that's okay. So anyway, yeah, we could do a whole podcast on that. <laughs> I could definitely see you having a Patreon page. If you like post up uh, game reviews or something like that. Yeah, I could see that. It would be good. For sure. Well, Grant, it's been about an hour. This has been an absolute uh, pleasure you chatting with me. you. And um, yeah, I, I wish you the best. And when you do come, I'm going to keep an eye on your schedule. Oh, your website, your website. It is. Yeah. Uh, GrantLyon.com. Um, Grant, easy enough. Grant L-Y-O-N. Yep. There we go. L-Y-O-N. So, um, yeah, I'm going to check it out, and I'm going to go see you, and maybe we'll get a chance to talk. But, um, yeah, be safe, sure. my friend, and yeah, uh, we'll chat soon. You stay safe, too.